I'm going to be making a lot of announcements every day around how we're going to be able to get back to work, how we're going to slowly reopen our economy, and a lot of detailed announcements, and the details really matter. So uh, if you're tuning in every day, great, keep doing it. Um, if you're not, I would recommend that you, you do, because we're going to start to get into a pattern of every day a little bit more information, and it'll be important for you to digest that so you can keep yourself safe and as healthy as possible. We'll begin um, with the cases. You can see the cases on the screen, the data on the screen. We're reporting 341 new cases today. Uh, and as per usual, Dr. Nicole Alexander-Scott will go through the details. Um, as I've been saying for the past week or so, we seem to have hit a plateau, and that is definitely good news. Um, we're still not in a decline, which is where I wish we were, um, but a plat we'll take the plateau. You know, we, we, we're not out of the woods, certainly not out of the woods, and by the way, as we continue to do more testing in vulnerable communities, in the inner city, in our nursing homes, you know, it's clear that we're not out of the woods. But the fact that you can see on your screen a leveling off is a testament to your hard work and our hard decisions. And it's, it should let you breathe a sigh of relief, a plateau, a flattening. Uh, from day one, we've said we want to flatten the curve. Well, we've done that. And so I want to thank you for your cooperation. And um, although we're not out of the woods, just take a breath. Take a breath with me that we're doing the right things and we're doing a good job and we are in a good place. Uh, okay, I want to start to set some expectations about what we're going to be doing together over the next couple of weeks. So as a reminder, I have a stay-at-home executive order in place now in the state of Rhode Island. That is set to expire on May 8th. And it is my hope um, at this point to be able to let that expire on May 8th. Now, I want to be clear about this. That is not a foregone conclusion. I have said that every time, but I'm going to continue to reiterate it. You may know, and others have noted to me, that Massachusetts has extended their stay-at-home order, Connecticut has extended their stay-at-home order, New York and New Jersey have extended it. And I hear that, I understand that, I'm talking to them, and I'm looking at their data, and I'm looking at our data. I'm never going to do anything that I believe, that we believe, is unsafe. Having said that, we look at the data every day. And it isn't just the aggregate data of cases or hospitalizations. It's also, you know, the ability of our system to deal with the crisis. Are we able to test everybody in nursing homes and communal living situations? Are we able to test everybody in the Latino community and hardest hit communities? Are we able to act quickly enough and take care of people if there is an outbreak? And from, from everything I see now, if we continue to stay on the path that we're on now, which is to say a plateauing and maybe even a decline, then it is my intention to let that stay-at-home order expire on May 8th. I do want to say this. We know that the, the data and the, the, the plateauing is extremely sensitive to the behavior of Rhode Islanders, which is to say, if you go out this weekend and next week when the weather is nice and warm and sunny and everybody congregates in the park and people start to sneak back into their offices and we don't wear our masks and we don't obey the stay-at-home order, then it's almost certainly the case that I will not be, that I'll have to do what other governors are doing and extend our stay-at-home order. And I really don't want to do that because too many people are struggling and are out of work. So as I've said every day, please hang in there a little longer. We're on a good path. We're on a safe path. Obey the stay-at-home order, as we all will do, until May 8th. And, and I hope that on May 9th, we can begin a slow process of reopening our economy. Um, to that point, 
I'd like to make some announcements now that I hope provide you with a glimmer of hope of where we're going. So I announced, I, I think last Friday, that I was asking um, DEM Director Janet Coit to work with the team around the reopening of our parks and beaches. And I'll say one of the difficult decisions I've had to make in the past month is deciding to close our parks and beaches. That, that was a tough one because I hope everyone can spend some time outside every day. I still hope that and encourage that. And also one of the best things about Rhode Island, the Ocean State, are our parks and beaches. So um, the good news is we're planning for a phased reopening. And like every other announcement that I'll be making in the next two weeks, it's phases, it's phases. I have often said reopening the economy won't be a flick of the switch. It's not putting the light switch on. Think of it more like a dimmer on a light. We're gonna slowly turn the lights back on. So let me give you a sense of what phase one of opening parks and testing the waters will be like. When we begin phase one, which I hope is May 9th, we'll be reopening some parks, including Lincoln Woods, Haynes Park, Snake Den, Beaver Tail, and Fort Adams. By the end of the day today, there will be a full list of the phase one parks to be reopened on the DEM website. So you can, by the end of the day today, check out the DEM website. You can look for the park that is near you. And if it's on the list, it means that on May 9th, when we start the reopening, hopefully, um, those parks will be reopening. It's not gonna be just reopening the park. We're gonna re be reopening with reduced parking capacity to promote social distancing and with increased enforcement to make sure we enforce the social distancing. So in phase one, you'll be able to go to the park, you'll be able to drive to the park and park your car. You could take a walk, you can go for a run, you can go with your, you know, your immediate family and friends, that small group that you're being with these days. But you're not gonna be able to do things like have, have a cookout or have a huge football game or any kind of organized sports in the park. It's gonna be, and, and you should probably limit your time so that everybody has a chance to enjoy the park. But you can go with your family, with the people you've been with, you can park your car and you can enjoy the outdoors. The name of the game in this phase one, whether it's parks or anything else, is just take it easy. Go slow, test the waters, whatever helps you think of going slow is what I want you to think. Just, just gently get back out there so that we can do it safely. Uh, six feet apart. We still want to be saying six feet apart. If you go to the park with your family, you want to play ball with your family, that's great. Have fun. For other people that you see there that you don't know, six feet apart. No pickup basketball games, no, you know, pickup sports games. Um, but go outside and enjoy it and get some exercise. In phase two, we'll relax some of those, uh, some of that guidance. Many of you um, want to know about the beaches. Yesterday I had a press conference for kids and we had thousands of questions and many were about, can I go to the beach this summer and go swimming? So um, in phase one, we are not gonna reopen the beaches just yet. However, in phase two, we will look to do that, which will be coincident with Memorial Day anyway, which is about the time that we're looking to go back to the beach. There will be new restrictions, new restrictions about parking, new restrictions about how, you know, how to use pavilions and bathrooms and such. Uh, so I'm not prepared today to give an announcement on that, but I want you to know we're working on it. And for those of you who wanna know, can we go to the beach this summer? The answer is going to be yes, assuming we stay on a good path. Um, and we'll be back to you with more guidance around how to do that safely and in accordance with social distancing. So I hope that provides you a glimmer of hope. We aren't there yet. We can't go all rushing out to the beach or the park tomorrow, but we're gonna get there. 
we're going to get there and we can all look forward to that time and and maybe start now thinking about a nice day on the beach and that'll get you through a dreary day like today when you're stuck in your house okay i want to take a minute to talk about child care um, i want to begin by recognizing how unbelievably difficult this pandemic is for families and for working moms and dads I know how hard it is, and I just want to take a second to um, let you know that I wish we could do better, and I wish I could do more to make it easier for you. Uh, for those of you who are lucky enough to still have your jobs, it's still incredibly hard to be working at home, your kids at home with distance learning, and no child care. For those of you who've been um, laid off, it can be doubly difficult. So I do want to try to stand up childcare again. We are gonna do that. Closing schools and closing childcare were some of the hardest decisions I had to make. But at the end of the day, public health experts said, and I know they're right, it was the only safe option. Leaving childcare centers open would have increased the state um, to a much greater spread of the disease. Having said that, I don't want to keep them closed a second longer than necessary, and I know that as people start to go back to work, we have to open childcare. So as I said earlier this week, and as I'm going to say again, same thing, think of the light switch. We're going to slowly turn up capacity in childcare. DH to get us there, DHS, run by Courtney Hawkins, has asked child care providers to submit their plans for reopening by May 22nd with a targeted reopening date of June 1st. Child care facilities, to give parents a sense of what's coming and a sense of confidence, child care facilities are going to be operating under a whole new series of guidelines and restrictions, very stringent restrictions to make sure your children and their caretakers are safe. There's going to be reduced group sizes of 10 or fewer, um, stable groups, so the kids interact with the same kids and the same teachers every day, um, different staffing plans. We'll be following CDC cleaning guidelines, new drop-off and new pickup protocols, temperature screening for kids, um, a whole bunch of new design features so that we can keep everybody as safe as possible. We're going to be asking a lot of our child care providers, and we're also going to be asking them to um, spend more money in order to comply with these new regulations around cleaning and mask wearing and the like. So as a result, to support them and to enable this, and to make sure they have the resources they need to keep your kids safe. We're going to be temporarily raising the child care rates for child care providers in the CCAP program. I want to be clear about this. I want to get this done by June 1st. We have a plan and we're managing our team to a plan to reopen child care with less capacity in a targeted way with new safety regulations by June 1st. Having said that, this is a tall order. It will be ahead of many, if not all, other states. So please forgive us if we don't quite make June 1st. But, but let me be clear. We're going to do everything we can to get done by June 1st, because I know you need it. I know people need it. I know, especially if you're getting back to work, you need some child care. I want to thank not only Courtney Hawkins and her team, I want to thank all the child care providers for what you've done and for what you're going to do. This is the beginning of what we're all going to have to do. Change the way we work, change, change the way we schedule shifts, change the number of people who can be in a room, think about cleaning, you know, well, constantly, especially in the, in the instance of childcare, having fewer, think, fewer surfaces around for people to touch. So uh, we're going to do it. We're going to stand childcare back up. We're going to stand this economy back up. We're going to use our beaches and parks again. But I want everyone to start understanding, really understanding, 
that it's going to look different, it's going to feel different, it's going to be difficult, uh, but it's what we're going to do, and we're going to do it together, and we're going to be stronger for it. Okay, um, also on the theme of slowly reopening our economy, I'd like to take a minute to talk about elective and non-critical surgeries and procedures at hospitals. So first, I want to begin with a thank you to hospitals. Uh, they've been phenomenal through this from day one. We're throwing a lot at them, and they're responding beautifully. One of the things that we did in Rhode Island and in every other state in America um, was to ask hospitals at the beginning of the crisis to stop doing non-critical procedures. That was necessary while they built up their capacity of PPE, testing, additional equipment, ventilators, et cetera. Now, due to our good work, we're getting to a place where we, want, where we want to allow them to start reopening for elective surgeries, procedures, and non-critical procedures. I do want to recognize that that decision has caused extreme financial stress for our hospitals and also extreme inconvenience, to put it mildly, for patients. So if you're a Rhode Islander out there, who's been waiting for more than a month for a surgery or a procedure or a test that you thought was gonna be scheduled, was gonna happen in the end of March or beginning of April, I'm, I'm sorry we had to do this and I realize it's been incredibly difficult for you. Um, I told you we'd get you back as soon as we could and today I'm telling you that's gonna be very, very soon. We asked last week for all hospitals to submit to the Department of Health their plans to reopen for these non-critical procedures. I wanna thank the hospitals. Every one of you got your plans in. They are um, excellent and uh, just about being finalized with the Department of Health. We have a little bit more work to do this weekend as between the Department of Health and the hospitals. But I expect that starting next week, I'll be back up here making some announcements that certain hospitals um, are gonna be back in the business, if not next week, the week after, with elective surgeries and non-critical procedures. And I want the public to know this. These plans that they've submitted are incredibly detailed. They take into account infection control, uh, new workflows, new procedures, more testing. None of us is gonna allow you to go back to a hospital if we don't think it's safe. Which means that next week when I start making announcements that different hospitals are up for elective surgery, I want you to have confidence that it is safe for you to go. So that when you start hearing from the hospital about rescheduling procedures, I want you to have confidence to know it is safe and you should go and get the health care that you need and deserve and that'll help you get better. One final note on hospitals, um, and this is something that the health department has been saying and I know doctors Babineau and Finale have been saying, if you're sick and you need urgent health care, go to the hospital or go to your doctor. If it's truly an emergency, go to the emergency room. If you need to see your doctor, call your doctor and go see the doctor. Doctor's offices are open. The hospitals are absolutely open. Um, we have seen a decline in, in ER use and in, in people showing up. So um, if you're sick, if you need to see a doctor, don't stay home and get sicker. Call your doctor, go to the ER if it's an emergency, and make sure you get the health care you need. Finally, I want to make one um, announcement about uh, debt collectors and whether they can go ahead and seize your stimulus check. We have been hearing from a lot of worried Rhode Islanders who unfortunately have debt and have debt collection agencies on top of them to collect the debt, and they're worried that the debt collectors are gonna start seizing their stimulus checks, just like a wage garnishment, that they'll be able to go in there and access that. I want you to know that's not gonna happen. So if, you, if this is you and you're worried, 
take a deep breath right now and, and know that that isn't going to happen. And I want to give a big thank you and shout out to our terrific Attorney General, Peter Narona. He's been working hard to understand this issue, and he has announced that he is prepared to enforce against debt collectors who try to access people's stimulus checks. The CARES Act does not allow for that, and he's prepared to protect you and make sure the debt collectors cannot access your stimulus checks. If you are worried or you're being hassled by a debt collector, call the Attorney General's office, the Consumer Protection Division, 274-4400, and he and his team will help you and, if necessary, take legal action against the debt collector to protect you. Now, I do want to say this. The purpose of the stimulus checks is actually to help you pay your bills. So, although if you're out of work, it's incredibly hard, and I know you're struggling, and you, and you need this to buy food and keep the lights on, but on the other end of the equation, if you, you know, as a landlord who's also struggling to pay their bills and is, is a company that is in trouble, so try to use your stimulus check to pay the bills, to pay your rent, to pay your utility bills, to keep current on your bills. That's what the money's for. We don't want you to get behind on your bills more than necessary. And that, for that money to stimulate the economy, we need to use it to pay our bills to keep stimulating the economy. Having said that, the purpose of the stimulus was not to um, enrich debt collectors. So we're not going to let that happen to you, and we're going to protect you.